Hi, everybody. I am Wendy Clough, Community Relations Representative here at the Gardens at Town Square. Before we start today's presentation on gardening with Cisco Morrison, I would love to share a little bit about your host, the Gardens at Town Square, a beautiful senior living community here in downtown Bellevue. We are conveniently located and just steps away from local favorites like the French Bakery, Shops at the Bravern, and the Bellevue Public Library. We're also just minutes from medical centers like Overlake Hospital and Kaiser. The Gardens is known for its feeling of independence and vibrancy, our relationship with the University of Washington, and a lifelong learning focus. It's warm hospitality and lovely amenities, including some of the brightest and most cheerful dining venues around, plus a serene private garden courtyard. So we'll be paying special attention to Cisco today. Uh, the garden features a wide variety of newly renovated beautiful apartments, including studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and even a three bedroom layout. Please check out our website to see new self-guided virtual tours of some of these floor plan styles. Residential options include independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Give us a call to book a tour and ask any and all questions you may have. We are here to help. And now on to our presentation. Cisco Morris is a gardening expert, TV and radio personality and author who is well known here in the Pacific Northwest. His book, his book Ask Cisco was a bestseller and he recently came out with a new book, Ooh La La, last year. When he is not speaking or writing, Cisco is often gardening at his home where he is now, I believe, in Northwest Seattle, Northeast Seattle, or off garden, hosting garden tours around the world. And we do have a signed copy of Cisco's newest book that we are gonna be giving away to one of the attendees today. Uh, and so we will do that by random drawing when the presentation is over today and then we'll notify you. We'll take it away, Cisco. All right. Hey, everybody, <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here on this beautiful day after we got all that wonderful rain, oh la la. <laughs> so, uh, and there's so much to do in the garden right now. It's unbelievable. So, uh, hey, I'm excited that one of you is going to win my new book. This was my very first book, Ask Cisco. It's a Q&A book. It was the number one selling garden book in the United States for a while. I don't know how that happened, but I'm happy. And uh, this book is different. It's not a question and answer book like my old one. It's short stories about gardening. And they're supposed to teach you something about gardening and make you laugh like crazy when you read the story. I read, I laugh like crazy when I wrote them. So I hope you're going to laugh too. And 10 minutes at bedtime cures all insomnia. So, okay, <laughs> let's, get in. let's get into this garden talk, okay? All right, now, uh, one thing that is so important in gardening and it is deadheading. So, so often we plant these lovely pelargoniums. This is a really good one, you know? Mm, and I love the smell of these. So we plant these and other annuals and perennials in there. And I uh, look at this, this is the fireworks series. This is a pelargonium or what we call a geranium. Is that showy or what? Mary scored these. And you know that Mary and I divide the garden into his and her gardens. If we didn't do that, uh, we'd probably murder each other. And marriage counseling is getting so expensive these days, you know. So, <laughs> so she went and found this incredible pelargonium. So I got the car, went over to get some more, the fireworks series. And they didn't have any more. And her container looks way better than mine because of this. Now. Once it turns to looking like this, you gotta deadhead these. All plants known on earth to reproduce. If you let them go to seed, they know they just raised a family. They can kick back, eat a little fertilizer, get a good suntan, do nothing for the rest of summer. So whenever this starts to look anything like this, you wanna get those pruners out and cut it all the way back from where it comes off the main plant. So if I was gonna deadhead one of these, it would be way down inside there where I would do it. So, 
And uh, by the way, here's some about uh, pelargoniums you may not know. And this came from my uh, TV show, Gardening with Cisco Live, that was on NWCN. It was a King 5 affiliate for about 14 years, showed in seven states. And uh, one time a woman called, she was from Idaho, and she said, we live on a farm and there's so many flies, we can't even open the door and flies fly right in. She said, is there any plant on earth that would repel flies if we planted it nearby? And I, I said, I've never heard of anything like that. Next caller was a woman with an Austrian accent. She was from Austria and she goes, uh, you think that we plant those pelargoniums like this in our window boxes in Austria just because they're pretty? I said, they, you don't? She goes, no, they repel flies. So I had never heard this before. So when Mary and I moved into our house, uh, we had a detached garage, which I love. And to get to our backyard, we have a lot of tours of our home garden. They're auctioned off to help good causes. They get the money. I have the fun of leading you on a tour. And if you ever come on a tour at my house, uh, you'll start with a glass of wine in your hand because you like my stories better that way. <laughs> but anyway, so to get to the backyard from the front, and the back garden is full of fountains and neat things, you have to... Uh, walk between the detached garage and the house. When we bought the house in winter. In summer, there were about 60 flies just flying in a circle between the house and the garage. And it was embarrassing when I bring people back. Nothing would get rid of them. I put fly paper up, everything, nothing helped. So I came over and I told Mary, I said, this Austrian woman said, you know, that the pelargoniums or geraniums repel flies. So we did, we put some containers between the house and the garage, planted them up and put some pelargoniums in there. Every fly gone. I couldn't believe my eyes. So we did this for about six years. Then after six years, I said, let's try that putting pelargoniums in this year, just to see what happens. The flies were back. So there is a magic cloudy. There's a wonderful smell in pelargoniums. It might be part of what it is. Okay, now I'm not just going to tell stories like that. I've got uh, something important to talk about here. And uh, so that is, just as I mentioned about uh, deadheading pelargoniums and things, one of the best things you could do is deadhead your roses. So as soon as this rose starts to not look good, this rose is uh, yellow, always kind of blows out, but uh, this rose is called South Africa. Hmm. You probably didn't see that, but my socks just rolled up and down when I smelled this. This is an incredible rose, disease resistant as can be. Any rose I plant in my garden, I buy disease resistant roses and they're coming out with more and more of them now so keep an eye out for them it usually says it on there somewhere so you'll know okay now the problem about deadheading roses you gotta be real careful when you prune roses now in spring i prune them way down to about six inches cut to an outward facing bud because that's the way the growth will go and you don't want to crowd the middle and i usually do that around march 1st and uh, so uh, by now, the, the roses are just starting to bloom. I fertilize mine with alfalfa meal that you can buy at nurseries. So that's horse food, you know. But uh, for some reason, horse food, alfalfa meal is not high in nutrients, but it's got all these micronutrients in there. And what they do is they basically... Uh, have things that tell a plant, bloom you fool, bloom. And boy, if you use alfalfa meal, you won't believe how well your roses bloom. I stick it in when I prune them in March. I put two cups around the average size two rows so you have an idea how much to use. Works great with dahlias too and peonies like it. Now on a rose or anything that blooms all summer long, every six weeks I give fertilizer. 
by the way, so two cups of alfalfa meal and a cup and however amount it says to use on the label of an organic rose food. So I mix those two together, work them into the ground, and I get so many beautiful blooms, you won't believe it. And I have about eight really nice roses spread throughout my garden in the bed. So the minute I see a rose not looking good, you want a dead hit. The problem is some of my roses are kind of in the bed and I don't like stepping on my perennials to get in there. Also, you never want to get stuck by a mildewed rose thorn. You can actually get a fungus disease and end up in the hospital if that happens. So always wear really good gloves if you're going to prune roses or you can use the cool tool I'm about to show you. Now, I don't work for these guys, but this is called a short reach uh, cut and hold pruner. And this is one of my favorite tools. They make long reach ones and I love those too. So I'm gonna tell you in a minute uh, where you can get this. It's, it, and I'm not trying to make sales for them, but I love it. So I wanted to share it with you. So uh, now the way this tool works is it turns different ways. And if you turn it a certain way, let's hope I did this right. <laughs> okay, then you could just reach into your rows, cut it off, it'll hold it. And then boop, you drop it into your bucket or whatever you're throwing them in. You don't have to reach in there at all. And I've gotten so good at using these. I can get just one little one Let's say there's a whole bunch of buds. I can reach in there and just get one flower out of there without interfering with a bug. But so this tool that I wanted to share with you is from the Wildflower Seed Company. Okay, so if you go online, it's www.wildflower-seed.com. Wildflower Seed Company. Just do a search. Wildflower Seed Company cut and hold pruner. You'll see all the ones they sell, but this is my favorite by a mile. I use this all the time for deadhead and perennials, for you know, cutting off a leaf that doesn't look good, whatever you need it for. This is your baby. Okay, now one more thing, and then I'll start taking some questions. We'll go back and forth. And that is okay. So uh, you might be surprised to learn that peonies, this is a peony now that's done blooming, that peonies actually are the reason that I am an avid gardener today. And that's because I live next door to the state champion peony grower in Wisconsin. So in Wisconsin, we can only grow three plants. <laughs> it's so called lilac, uh, uh, hosta, and peony, that was about it when I was growing up. So anyway, uh, I live next door. To the, this woman won the Blue Ribbon at the Big State Fair for her peony flowers almost every year. She was famous for this. So I was 10 years old. And if I had any fame, it was for being quite a little league player. I, I could hit like, you know, I was like each year old, you know, always got a hit. And I was fast as a whip. So I love baseball. And so uh, I just so happens, I looked across the fence and she had so many peonies in rows back there. And all the big peony buds, it was two days before the state fair. So these buds would probably open just on time for the state fair. All those peony buds were right in the strike zone. So I went over there with my bat, 10 years old, and hit every bud for a home run. I was sort of famous in the neighborhood for a while after that. And my punishment was I had to work with her all summer long to help her in her garden to make up for this. This was two days before this big state fair. And uh, the reason that I got into gardening was because every time I went over to help her garden, when I saw the way she looked at me, <laughs> I thought, 
there must be something really good about Flint. So uh, thanks to her uh, peonies, I became a well-known gardener. Now, uh, I brought a peony here and, uh, and you know, this, this is one, uh, this is a special peony I want to tell you about, but uh, now I'll just show off by uh, cutting off another, oh, see, I didn't have it twisted the right way. So you got to always make sure you twist it the right way or it won't hold it. That's the one problem is sometimes I get mixed up. So peonies, this is an Ito peony. And if you have never tried an Ito peony, I love peonies. And I give them one shot of alfalfa meal and a good rose food in about, I would say, you know, mid-March. Work it into the ground around it. I'd probably use one cup of uh, alfalfa meal and the recommended amount of uh, rose food for the peony. They usually tell you for how big a plant, how much to put on. And, uh, and then I get great blooms, but you know, now with a rose, I fertilize every six weeks all summer long because they just keep producing. Something like a peony you only need to do it once. And I do need to give you a warning about alfalfa meal. Alfalfa meal is somewhat alkaline. So there's some plants like delphiniums and dahlias and peonies and roses that love that little extra lift of uh, soil pH. But don't ever put it on your rhododendron, uh, on your camellia, on your sarca coca, that sweet box. Don't put it on the plants that like acid soil. They won't be happy. I put it on my sparkling, beautiful blue hydrangea and it turned all the flowers, the ugliest mauve color you've ever seen because in acid soil, uh, hydrangeas are very blue, but in alkaline soil, they turn toward red. So it took me a long time to get the beautiful blue again. Now, now this is an Ito peony. So this is the only cross. So for years and years, people wanted to cross tree peonies with herbaceous peonies. No one could do it. No one could figure out how to do it. Then during World War II, a guy named Mr. Ito in Japan uh, started experimenting, trying to figure out a way to do it. In 1948, his first Ito peony, a cross between a tree peony and an herbaceous peony bloomed. Unfortunately, he died right before it bloomed. That is the bummer story of all time, you know, but that's the way life is sometimes. So his family realized they had something really valuable. They sold the secret because he took all kinds of notes. They sold the secret notes to uh, an American guy in the United States. So uh, that guy started selling Ito peonies. So what you get is a flower almost as big as a tree peony, but they stand up, they don't fall down, and they, they last way longer because they keep putting out buds and butts. And of course you want to deadhead them so they keep producing them. You're going to get three weeks of bloom instead of one week as you do with most peonies. You only get three feet tall and uh, they, and you prune them like you do a peony right back down to the ground. Now, uh, the first of the Ito peonies that became for sale, because the only way you could get them was to cross them. And only one guy had the secret. People were paying 1500 bucks for an Ito peony. Well, I don't remember how many years ago it was. They started to learn to do tissue culture. They just take a, a little piece of some of the tissue somehow they're able to grow it in a test tube and get a new plant. And so when I bought my first Ito peony called Bartzella, Bartzella, it cost me $99 for a one gallon pot, still pretty much. Last summer, I bought one called Sonoma Apricot, 25 bucks. So the price is coming down at me. Now, one of the big questions I get is how do you stake like 
some of these herbaceous peonies, they just flop over. Or what about delphinium? You know, delphinium with those straight up beautiful blue flowers that can reach six feet tall. My favorite is cobalt blue. Oh, I love that. That's a delphinium elatum. And so how do I stake those? Because, you know, in the old days, I couldn't figure out how to stake them. I'd have rebar around them. Then I'd tie ropes around them. Pretty soon the plant looked like a hostage out in the front garden, you know? So I figured out, I figured I got to learn how to do this. And I, I admit it, I am a genius for coming up with something this smart, but <laughs> very humbly I say that though. So, okay. Uh, you can go to the nursery and buy this. It's called a circle grid staking system. So they come with uh, these, these uh, connecting rods that you stick them on and they come with different lengths and different uh, size circumference for the circle. So buy one, I don't know, this one's, you know, probably one of the smaller sizes. You gotta put this out before your delphinium or peony grows through this. And uh, so the first one I stick at a foot and a half. Now I go out and I buy one that's wider, has a wider circumference than this one. And, I, and you get longer staking poles and you connect it. And this now will be at three or three and a half feet high. And this all has to be set up before the, before the plant grows into it. One other thing, this is a zip tie. This is a gardener's best friend. I use these all the time. What you're gonna to wanna to do is put that through so that there, so you can make sure this connector can't get loose. Because if you don't do that, these are so flimsy, it'll come right off, the whole thing goes down. It's a disaster. So you've got to use zip ties to tie that all up. Plant grows through there. Even in really windy days, my delphinium stay up. They never fall down, you know, and uh, and with peonies, it holds them up. And you don't see the staking system. It's all inside. This works so good. It's unbelievable. So next time you want to stake something, try that technique. Make sure you use two of them. Make sure you use the zip ties. And uh, you'll be surprised how well this will work. Okay, I'm ready to take the first question if we've got any yet. Okay, <laughs> maybe I better keep going for a minute. All right, so uh, one thing I, all right, I'm gonna show you how to get rid of weeds, the best way to get rid of weeds. Okay. And uh, after, after I do this one, if there's any questions, we can take a question. Let's see if we've got any yet. Okay, so, all right. This is a sprayer I bought. I think I got this at Ace Hardware. I'm not sure where I got this. I've had it forever. Notice I bought one with a long wand because you don't want to be bending over. If you got a short wand, you're going to be bending over like mad. Now, what do I put in this sprayer? Straight white vinegar from the grocery store. So straight white vinegar is one of the best herbicides you'll ever see. It'll pretty much kill anything you hit. Now, if I was gonna try and kill a great big, you know, bunch of ivy or something, I don't know if it would work. You'd have to use about five gallons of this stuff to work. But I use this for a number of things. Now, notice something at the end. So this is a bottle. This came off a drinking water bottle. And what I did was I uh, duct taped it on the end. First, I took off the little nozzle in there, duct taped this on the end, and then put the nozzle back on because the nozzle was too fat to go through the little part you drink in. Now, why did I put that on there? Because then I could put this right over whatever weed I'm trying to get. And when I spray, I'm not going to massacre a whole lot of other stuff. The spray is going to go right on the weed. Now, Vinegar only works good on a hot sunny day. I was out doing it in the cracks between my sidewalks uh, 
before I came to do this talk today. And uh, so the big question I get a lot is people say, well, I got dandelions in my lawn. I don't want to use weed and feed because weed and feed has been associated uh, with um, lymphoma in dogs and other problems. So I don't mess with weed and feed, you know. And I was a director for grounds care at Seattle University, and we never used weed feed, weed and feed there because the young people are out on the lawn, sunbathing all the time, everything else. I'm not going to take a risk for anybody's health. And I got two dogs that I just love to live and to eat a lot of too, you know. So, so how do you get rid of those dandelions and broadleaf weeds in your lawn? Right here, this is it. So now this is, you use straight white vinegar. You do not dilute it. And you can't be dainty with it either. So uh, when you put this over the weed to nail it, you got to give it a good squirt. I mean, if it's... If you just go, it's not going to do anything. I, I go, and, uh, but it, it'll kill that dandelion. On a hot, sunny day, that dandelion is dead in two and a half hours. You remember when the Wicked Witch of the West in Over the Rainbow got some water squirted on her, and she's like, I'm melting, I'm melting. That's what you hear the weeds start to shout when you squirt them with if. Now, there is a problem, you're, and you'll be really mad at me if you don't know about it. And that's you're going to kill the grass. Anything that's in that circle right there is going to get killed. So you're going to kill a little circle of grass. Even though a dandelion can be pretty big, and sometimes I don't get much grass. But you, so a dandelion will die, and it'll be dead by the next day. I guarantee it. And I mean dead. They don't come back. It's not like using a dandelion pour. You get two for the price of one. It just snaps the root. You get two dandelions for every one you pull out. You have millions of holes all over your lawn to boot. So uh, I wait a couple of days after I do it. Maybe dilute some spots with a little bit of water in case there's some vinegar effect in there. It doesn't last long, though. And then you just go out there with some kind of tool, poke some holes in the ground, and put grass seed in those holes where you've got the dead spot of grass. Now, you can't put the, the grass seed right on the soil surface. There's too much thatch. That's a bunch of entangled roots and stems, and uh, they're mostly dead. But they, so if the little grass seed germinates on there, its roots probably will never make it to the soil. There's too much in the way. So poke the holes, put the grass seed in the holes. Uh, Put a little organic uh, lawn food out there. Keep it moist. And uh, within three weeks, you'll never know that there was even a dead spot on your lawn. Usually it's even faster than that. But within three weeks, I can pretty much guarantee as long as you keep it a little moist so that grass seed, because baby grass seed doesn't have deep roots. It's got to have some moisture. And uh, they'll be gone for good. So uh, now, at my, I do this at spring and fall. And uh, my, the house next door looks like a dandelion farm. There are so many dandelions in that wall. And it's unbelievable. So you know, seeds are just coming to mind. So do it once in spring, once in fall. Usually there's three or four dandelions I got to deal with. That's it for the rest of the year. My, my lawn is dandelion free and beautiful. So, uh, so this is a good tool to know about. There is one thing, one warning I have to give you, you know, and that is that if you got a hot date planned for the night uh, after you do this spray and vinegar, make sure it's someone who likes pickles because you are going to smell like the world's greatest pickler for three days if you have to squirt this on a lot of weeds. But, but it works. I guarantee that. Okay, well, how about if we see if we have a question yet? Somebody we do. Wants... We have a few. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, when pruning plants, do you clean the pruner often to prevent plant disease spread? That's a great, great question. So uh, this is my favorite kind of pruner right here. This is a Felco number 
break because I'm right-handed. Falco number nines are for left handies. Fits really well in your hand. It's comfortable. But uh, so do you need to clean them off? I don't. And I was a professional pruner for years. If I'm pruning something that I know is diseased. So if I was uh, pruning uh, maybe uh, some botrytis, which is a fungus disease off peony, then I might, uh, you know, uh, sanitize them between each cut. And the only rubbing alcohol does not work. I've seen so many people say, oh yeah, I do rubbing alcohol. It doesn't work. It doesn't kill most of the funguses and things. You got to use bleach, 10% bleach solution. The problem with 10% bleach solution is that you better really clean them off good when you're all done because bleach just uh, makes uh, things corrode like mad. So only if I'm pruning something I'm really worried about spreading disease, you know, and there are some that I do like uh, lilac gets a bacterial disease where the end of the branch goes like this, like a shepherd crook. And yeah, I cut back beyond the disease, but I clean them off when I do something like that. And I do try to keep, I've had these pruners practically forever. So I try to keep them clean. And uh, I, what I do is I, um, I spray them with WD-40. I take some sandpaper and clean them off. And then just to keep them nice and sharp, I, uh, I use a file. They sold this file right next to the pruners. I've had these pruners so many years, I can't even remember. When you had to replace one pair of pruners, and I lost them in someone's garden and never could find them. So, uh, so here's how you do it. You start with the coarse side and you only do the side with a bevel and just go right along just like that and then just turn it around. And uh, these Felcos are Swiss steel. They cost about a hundred bucks now. I probably paid 20 bucks for these. Woo! Those are sharp, but this is Swiss steel. <laughs> These are great. Get yourself a good holster too, because that way you won't be putting holes in the upholstery of your car or uh, your pants. So, uh, but no, I don't, I don't, unless I have to, I don't do it. It's too much of a hassle. And usually there's not that many diseases out there. Let's hope, okay. right? Um, <laughs> another question is, uh, well, Leanne says, thank you for all the weeding tips, which is great. Uh, she said, that's her biggest challenge. What is the best way to get rid of wild grass? Ooh, wild grass is really hard to get rid of. So we've got quack grass, all these grasses that grow up right through your plant. And uh, now I'm not an advocate of using uh, like Roundup, but sometimes with wild grasses, you have to. So if that grass, is growing through your plant. What you can do is get one of those sponge paintbrushes, wear rubber gloves, and I'd wear, you know, some kind of mask to do this. And uh, hold the grass up here and just be careful not to drop any on your plant. Just rub it on the wild grass with the paintbrush. That's all it'll take to kill that grass. Roundup kills grass better than anything I've ever seen. Now, uh, so that you can almost always do that. It's painstaking because, you know, you're down there, each piece of grass, but they're gone for good, you know, and that's a really wonderful thing about that. Now, uh, if, if it's wild grass in your lawn, then probably if it were me, I would spray, uh, vinegar on the wild grass and you might have to do it twice, hottest, sunniest day you can get and then reseed that area with good grass. And uh, that's, that's uh, about the best solution I have for that. I wish there was another easy way to get rid of wild grass, but a lot of those grasses, uh, if you leave one little piece of root, they're back. So you gotta get them with a uh, systemic herbicide, unfortunately. Okay, well, that's good information. Um, and one other question is how do I prevent moss growing between my patio stones. Oh, I've got that one too. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty common here. You know, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, if you stand still outside for 20 minutes, sometimes moss starts growing on your nose. I mean, <laughs> we are in the moss capital of the world here, you know? So uh, in my opinion, well, here's how I found out how to get rid of it. Uh, we, we had a big stairway at Seattle University and uh, it had all these uh, paving stones that went all the way up. It was a big, long uh, walkway. I used to direct the grounds care at Seattle U. Between every paving stone, weeds grew. It was horrible. Administration was always on my case and they're going, you should spray Roundup up there. And I'm going, no, I don't want to spray Roundup. So we got it with vinegar and it worked great. So uh, we went up there and sprayed the vinegar, but we had another problem with that walkway, that big one st uh, stairway. It had a lot of moss on it. And in winter time, it, got, it could be pretty slippery and we were worried about that. And I used to send people up with scrapers and scrape it off. Well, guess what? The vinegar got all of the moss when it got the uh, weeds. So if you don't have plants between your stepping stones, the vinegar is going to get that uh, moss so good you won't believe it. So I think you got an easy solution for that one. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I know moss is a, <laughs> everybody's got it, right? And sometimes oh. it's beautiful and sometimes it's not. So that's great. Oh, I should add something too. Because uh, people always ask me, what about moss in my lawn? Well, number one thing to remember about moss is it's opportunistic. And that means that if your lawn thins out and there's open you know, space between the grass blades, then, and most of us don't water our lawns till summer and they kind of tend to thin out, moss moves right in. It doesn't care if it's in the shade or sun. So uh, sort of the trick to keep moss out of your lawn is to keep your lawn thick. If you can afford to pay for the water and do all that, then uh, moss won't move into a thick lawn where the sun doesn't uh, get all the way down to the earth. You know, if the lawn's thick and you, I always mow my lawn when it's three inches to two inches and I never pick up the clippy. But uh, if you've got moss already, you have to get rid of it. Now, iron sulfur, it's iron sulfate, gets rid of moss. Moss hates that stuff and it kills it quite effectively. However, you gotta be really careful with that stuff. It sounds like it's something you could just use without worrying. My friend had a cat, her cat walked on the lawn after she put that stuff on, licked its paw and it killed her cat. <laughs> and she was so wrecked from that. Oh, you don't want anything to happen to your pet or kids. So there are soaps that you can use now, and I think it's called Moss Out Soap. And you could use that also, you know, on, on your walkways, your stepping stones, but it's quite effective and you can use it on a lawn and it's much safer. It's a hose end deal, stick it on the end of your hose and it's got a little thing and whoosh, and uh, it does quite a good job. So that's something, then keep your lawn thick and tall if you, can and you won't get almost any moss at all. Okay, I, I'm going to show great. something. Okay, I'll show something, then I'll take another question. All right. Let me see. I'm trying to find where my wood chips are here. Oops. Uh oh. My assistant here, Mary, who's actually my <laughs> boss, if you want to know the truth, she was getting me all my samples, but she forgot on that one. <laughs> hey. Well, I'm waiting. I'll show you a couple of plants if you want to attract hummingbirds like mad to your garden. Here's one right here. So this is a woody salvia. I can't remember the name of this, but my favorite one is called hot lips. And the first flowers are red like this. The next ones are red and white. And finally, at the end of summer, they're almost all white. Now, these things, when you buy them, they're about this tall. By the end of summer, they're four and a half feet by four and a half feet. It's unbelievable. And I actually counted how many flowers were on my hot lips salvia 
and they sell these in all the nurseries. Last summer in August, 12 billion 947. So, and you, with that many flowers, you think I could cut some off to show in my garden plots? No, now me first started dive bombing me. It's on the, uh, the metal thing. Uh, the, it's in a box. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, I mean, hummingbirds dive for these and they've been blooming for a month already and they'll be in bloom after Thanksgiving. So the hummingbirds love to live a tweedle out of this. So this is woody salvia, there's millions. I have one that's yellow, I have one that's red. Every spring, probably about the beginning of April or mid-March to late March, depending on the weather, once I see lots of new growth coming up from the bottom, I cut them down to about uh, four inches from the ground. Then they grow back beautiful. They start blooming pretty darn soon. And you won't have all the blooms way out on the outside or way on the top because they bloom as they grow. So that's pretty cool. Another really good one is uh, this right here. Now this is a rare one. But, and I don't know if you'll find it at your local nursery, but if you do a search, you could probably buy this mail order. So this has like four to six foot long branches coming out of this. This is hardy in my garden. And uh, this is called uh, a, uh, a butylon, or some people call them flowering maples. Uh, so a uh, butylon megapotamicum, but what people are calling it, because that's so hard to say, people are calling it hardy a butylon now. So, so you could go to the nursery and say, can you get me a hardy a butylon? Hummingbirds die for these. And I leave this out year round. Now there's a whole lot of butylons. Some are hardy, some aren't. Unfortunately, there's only one way to find out if they're hardy or not, but, um, this guy comes back every year covered with these beautiful flowers that hummingbirds just love. I'll show uh, uh, one more here. And this, this is kind of rare too, but a lot of quality nurseries do carry these. And uh, this is called, um, uh, oh geez, I forget now what the heck that name of it is. Oh, great. I should have eaten more Brussels sprouts last night. It, Gravilia. Gravilia, thanks. <laughs> oh boy. So uh, this is Gravilia Canberra gem. And it comes down, comes, we saw these hiking in Canberra, Australia, all over the place, but they're hardy here. Give them full sun and uh, well drained soil. That's totally necessary. I barely ever even water this thing. And uh, they bloom all summer long. And there's one called uh, Gravilia Victoria, named after Queen Victoria, and they stuck an E on the end of the name. And that one blooms all winter long. As you know, our Anna's hummingbirds stay here year round. That's been happening since 1970 or so. And so it keeps them happy. If you travel with things, that gives them plenty of food all winter long to keep them happy. Okay, here's what I was going to show you before. And these are wood chips. Because the question I get a lot is what's the best mulch to use in my garden between the plants? So when I talk about mulch, I mean, you put it down on the soil surface, you don't work it in. Now, if you're gonna move plants all the time, like I do in my vegetable garden, because as soon as the Brussels sprouts are done, something else goes in their place, you know, the lettuce, they're done for the hot part of summer. You put in some cabbage plants and things. So there, I always use compost for a mulch because compost, you can work into the soil with no problem for the plants. It actually improves the soil. If you use a woody mulch, and this is wood chips left over after the arborist, you know, puts those branches through the big grinder, uh, you can't mix these into the ground. If you do, then all the little microorganisms in the soil know it's their job to break it down as far as it can into humus, which is what compost is. And so 
they attack this, trying to break it down, and they steal all your nutrition out of the soil in the process. You get it back, but not for a long, long time. So uh, this is something you only want to use on the surface. And if you've got, to, if you're going to plant a new perennial or something, you got to move them all the way out of the way, plant the plant, and then put the wood chips back. But why do I love them? By the way, I hate bark. I, I think bark, it's too uniform. It packs down like a rock and uh, it gets my sea limb in there and we keep adding on to it to make it look nice. And what happens is it stops the air and moisture from getting in the roots of our plants. And in Seattle U, I found that it was doing a lot of harm to a lot of our plants. So I was a cert certified arborist in those days. So I called all my certified arborist buddies and said, uh, bring over your wood chips because they got to get rid of them anyway because I need them for mulch at Seattle U. Now, why do I love this stuff? And that is because, uh, first of all, the wood chips, if you put them at least this thick over your lawn, okay, oh, I'm over your uh, ground, not the lawn. So what does that do? It stops the sun from hitting the earth for a for most weed seeds to germinate, they have to be hit by direct sunlight. So if you cover the soil with at least an inch or two, you can go six inches deep between plants if you want with this. What it does is it prevents the sun from reaching the earth and hitting those seeds. And so they don't germinate. And if they do germinate, they're way up in this stuff. They're never going to make it down there to grow anyway. So. So first of all, it gives you great weed control. The next thing is that anywhere you use these wood chips left over from the arborists, so I'll call them arborist wood chips, if you use those for a mulch, what happens is you get, they have a, a relationship with mycorrhizae in the soil. Mycorrhizae are little fungus nodules that attach to the roots of your perennial shrubs and trees, maybe annuals, I'm not sure, and what they do is they send out feeders to find food and water for the plant. And they get rewarded for doing that by uh, byproducts that come out of the roots. So, uh, so and uh, when I became a cert certified arborist, I worked with, I went down and studied with this famous tree doctor named Dr. Alex Scheigel. And we did a lot of digging of tree roots and things to look at them. Anywhere arborist chips were used, way more of these mycorrhizae than uh, any other kind of mulch. So that's the second great thing. Third great thing, these break down in one year. When you get them, it'll have all sorts of green stuff in it. And the wood chips typically break down. You have to do it, I do it every fall, okay? So I mulch every fall and that way I get hardly any weeds growing in spring. And this stuff, breaks down into the best topsoil you've ever seen. And where I've been using it for well over 20 years here, you should see my topsoil at my house. And at Seattle U, it's great. And best of all, it's free. Used to be free. I think it still is. There is a website and it's called Get Chip Drop. GetChipDrop.com. You can go to that or just to a search, get wood chips and arborist wood chips. And uh, you could sign up for them. The problem is you don't know when they're going to bring them. And, you know, that you got to tell them where you want them and all that. But uh, but you can get them for free. Now they say you can contribute to help the Arborist Association. And I think there's sort of a little hint that you'll get them quicker if you do that. So. <laughs> And now I'm going to give you a warning, and that is that, uh, you know, uh, I got my very first radio show in, uh, it was well over 30 years ago. And I was, at that time, I'm still a master gardener, and I was a master gardener in those days. And the extension agent uh, for uh, Washington, for Pierce County and King County had a radio show on Cairo Radio. And... Uh, he decided to retire. And so when he did, he picked me to take his show. So all my other master gardener buddies are going, 
why did he pick you? What's so special about you, you know? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I don't know why he picked me, you know? So, uh, so I was terrified of making a mistake. So on the first uh, few shows, I was a nervous wreck. So I'll never forget it was the eighth show because I knew everybody was watching to see if I could do this, you know? So on the eighth show, the way it works, you wear earphones to hear the person talking to a mic and you have a computer and all it does is tell you who's calling and where from. So I'll never forget it was Mary from Renton. So I push the button and I go, Mary from Renton, how are you? She goes, I want to wring your neck. <laughs> I'm like, I wanted to go, oh, did I lose her? You know, but I said, what did I do wrong? You know, and she goes, you know, those wood chips you told me to get? And I said, you didn't like them? She goes, that's not the problem. She goes, my husband was in taking a nap. He had a big business meeting he had to be in to go to in two hours. She said, I went off shopping and lo and behold, right down the street, here are the arborists throwing the big branches through the grinder. She's pulled over, took a look, because if sometimes if the grinders are really dull, you get this long stringy stuff. And that I don't like it. It's fine, but it doesn't look very good. So she took a look, it looked good. She talked to the person, said, hey, could, I'd like this. Can I have it? Oh yeah, you can have it, you know, the whole nine yards. She said, Imagine my surprise when I got home four hours later. And there was her husband standing there scratching his head on the back side of about a 15 yard pile of wood chips right in the middle of the driveway. And his car was behind it. And uh, he is like, where in the heck did this come from? So uh, the best thing I can tell you is if you order them, make sure you tell them, I only want five yards or whatever over on the edge of the driveway. Don't lock my car in there, you know? And I did give her good advice though. I told her to uh, buy some really good wine and invite all her neighbors over and give a little talk on the qualities of wood chips or maybe some of them would get rid of those things. Okay, let's see if there's another question. Yeah, so there's one related to that, uh, to the wood chips. The question is, what type of wood chips to use? Would western red cedar chips be harmful to some plants? You know, uh, western red cedar in the heartwood has, uh, has an oil in it that's harmful to plants. However, the chance of getting a western red cedar uh, when you get wood chips is very, very low. It's, there's very few of those ever get cut down anymore. And when they do, they don't cut into the heartwood. So chances are, even if you had straight red cedar, I don't think it would do hardly any harm at all. The other okay. question would be then, well, what about disease? What if I had a dogwood has, dogwood and fractals, a fungus disease that's really bad for dogwoods? If I get a bunch of that ground up and I got dogwoods, am I gonna get a disease? Well, we got wood chips from all over the city because all my buddies brought them with a giant, like 30 yard pile of them all the time at Seattle U. And we used them all the time. Never once did we see any increase in disease on the campus. So basically any kind of wood chip is all right. you know. Uh, I guess I wouldn't really want pure red cedar, but anything other than that is all right. And even red cedar really isn't going to do almost any harm at all. So nothing to worry about there. Okay. And then um, another question is, how can you know you are buying wood chips versus wood bark at a nursery? Oh, okay. So nurseries don't often carry arborist wood chips. That's one of the problems. I think they're going to start carrying them because people like me have been talking about them so much that uh, that's why they're charging for the wood chips from the arborist now because everybody wants them. It's getting competitive to get them. But somewhere like Sky Nursery, you have to call first. You could say, do you have arborist wood chips? 
And uh, they'll be honest, they'll go, no, we got bark or we got, we got wood chips. That's not arborist wood chips. They're usually way bigger, not what you want. So you gotta, so I would call around to nurseries and maybe um, any place that sells lots of different kinds of topsoils and bark. And I would definitely say, I, I'm only interested in arborist wood chips, do you carry those? And if they don't, then you're going to have to go to that uh, chipdrop.com on your computer and sign up. And it's kind of a pain, I admit it, but uh, it does work. You'll get the wood chips. Yeah, no, that's great. It sounds worth it. So final question, um, any tips for building a green bean trellis? Well, yeah, that's a now that's a really good question because there are so many plants that we can grow upward, you know. And the nice thing about green beans is they cling to things, you know. Some some things we try to get to grow up and over a trellis don't really cling, and so we got to tie them on and everything. Well, uh, one thing I've done over the years is done uh, three bamboos, three or four bamboos tied at the very top. So you tie them at the top and you could have, if you're doing blue lake climbing beans or something, you could easily have eight feet tall where it's at the top and you stick them securely in the ground. So this isn't costing you almost anything to make this. And I use this with peas, a lot of climbing plants, even sometimes with uh, clematis for instance, and then what you do, so you put that in there, plant your peas and I, uh, 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 beans, and I might plant, you know, if probably one under each one is all you need, uh, you know, in the middle, and it'll come out and grab. And then uh, what you could do to make it work better is take twine, horticultural twine, or you could do wire, whatever you want, and uh, you tie it to each of the four poles of the teepee at different heights. So at a foot and a half, you're gonna tie it around each one. And so when the, and then at uh, three feet and then, you know, four feet or five feet, whatever you're gonna do. And then as the beans grow, they'll have those to grab onto, not just the teepee poles. So, they'll find their way up there in no time at all. The only problem I've ever had if the twine rots out or something, but that doesn't happen very often. Twine usually lasts the whole season. I think that's about the way I, that's how I've done it over the years. Well, why would they want to do it anyway else then? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. This is fantastic. Really fun. Let, let me finish with uh, by telling, showing everybody the hummingbird mating dance since they were such oh. a good audience. <laughs> so, Please. Okay, <laughs> this is something you'll see in your garden. I see it all the time. So you want to plant a lot of plants that attract hummingbirds, you know, and there's Monarda delphiniums. There's a ton of plants that attract hummingbirds that I didn't show today. So you plant a lot of those and then you can put up a feeder if you want. And then here's what I see. So there's two kinds of hummingbirds that hang around my house. Rufus hummingbirds are kind of orange and smaller and they, they actually migrate back to Mexico every fall and make it all the way back 2000 to 2500 mm. miles every spring back to our gardens. But the Anna hummingbirds that stay in our gardens, uh, what they do is uh, they do this mating dance that I see a lot and it's really fun to watch. So if you're just sitting around, see if you see two female hummingbirds flapping their wings in the air. So at my house, it's Nellie and Nicholas. So it's Nellie and, uh, and Helen. Okay, so they're... They're just sitting there flapping their wings. They can flap their wings 80 times per second when they stand still in the air. All of a sudden, Howie comes shooting in between them, gives them both the eye, then from a dead stop without warning, 
beats his little wings 160 times per second, shoots like an arrow straight up in the air, hits speeds over 60 miles an hour, goes straight up about 120 feet, lots his wings into his side, goes into a death defying dive, just, just about to splat like a ripe tomato on the patio. He goes, misses a cement by one eighth inch. What us guys have to do for love. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to my <laughs> talk today. And thank you folks for having me here at the Gardens at uh, Town uh, Center. This was Sounds really, yep. really fun. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for attending today. We will email everybody an evaluation form and love to hear your feedback. And um, as well as any suggestions you might have for webinars that we could host in the future. And if you have any questions about the gardens at Town Square, please reach out to us at the number that's on the screen. Uh, and we also have a webinar coming up July 1st that that information is on the screen right now too. Um, that's about hearing and vision loss among older adults. So some really great information there. Um, and we'd love to see you soon and hear from you. So thanks so much. Have a great Wednesday.